And we can have a screen. Hello, good afternoon. Yeah, I'll do it in English, sorry. My Spanish is really bad. I know some of you for many years. I've been trying to learn Spanish for many years, but it's slow, sorry. <laughs> so it's a very difficult topic because how to be successful in video game project. Uh, you know, a lot of us have been trying to. Uh, it's pretty difficult. So I'm trying to cover it, uh, but uh, you know, doesn't mean that just by applying this you'll be successful. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of uh, different elements, you know, coming at the right time. So it's a lot of mix six that make it work or not. Just a quick introduction about me. So I've been in the video game business for 20 years now. I'm an old guy. Uh, started Disney uh, when Disney was making games, which is kind of stopped at the moment, but they may come back. I also work at Ubisoft. I was managing the brand Tom Clancy. Uh, for, so I don't know here if we have a lot of console PC guys, also some mobile guys, but I work at Subway, uh, at Cybo on Subway Surfers. You may know this mobile game. Two billion downloads. I think this is the most downloadable game in the world. So not too bad. Uh, then I work with publishers as well. Obviously, Disney was publisher, Ubisoft as well, 505 that you may know as well. And here in Spain, uh, well, you may know Take It Works, uh, which is kind of, I would say, the second biggest um, dev studio in, in Spain. So I'm working with them. Uh, we just mentioned two titles that you may have heard of that have been announced recently. Uh, we working with uh, Sony Pictures for the sequel of uh, El Dia de la Marmota. Ah, that's my only Spanish. Uh, here, and uh, we, you may have seen us on stage at GDC in San Francisco like three weeks ago when Google was announcing Stadia. So we are partnering with Stadia, uh, which obviously I cannot say anything about, uh, but just to give you some background. So uh, how to be successful? That's a very large question, complicated one. Uh, what I wanted is to focus on kind of five pillars, uh, which I think can help to, uh, let's say, to have a good game and to release something that can be successful. I'm not going to reassure you that when you do that, it's going to work and you'll be fully successful. But if you don't do that, I think that's obviously that's going to stop you um, to reach a good level. Uh, I think five things. So the team, and that's where I will start with, obviously. Uh, again, I don't know you guys. Uh, if you have already small studios, big studios, it depends, but I'm going to define kind of what I think a good team is and what it needs to succeed. Um, the game design, I'm not a game designer, so I'm most and foremost most business guys here, but I work with a lot of partners, of publishers and developers, so I think there are some key elements that need to be done in the game design if we want the game to work, and that's a key, obviously the game design. Production, uh, you know, it's, I will get some Excel and boring stuff here, but still, you know, if you don't have a project which is made by phases and adequate phase and well planned, that's not going to work. Financing, you need money. Obviously, media is one, one side, but sorry, it's not enough. Um, so you need to find money elsewhere. So where to find the money and how to get it. And publishing, uh, as I'm sure you know, the market is changing a bit, a lot. Um, we were in the market 10 years ago where obviously you do a project, you go to a publisher, and the publisher will finance, pay everything for it, and release a lot of physical games and also digital. Now, with digital change, more and more people and more and more developers can self-publish, co-publish, whatever, find different ways of publishing, and that's what I want to get into. Um, so, let me just start with the team. Uh, and I guess the team, the key question is, what is a good team? Uh, first, obviously, we are in video games, this is a creative industry, we need a creative team. So we need some people to come with a good, nice ID, whether it's, you know, you're a creative director, you've been doing games before, you haven't done games before, You've played some games you like, but of course, you need to come with this idea. You need to have this experience of what games are all about. So creativity is key. Well organized, it's also very important. I mean, you may be very small teams, one, two person. Again, I don't know, maybe you're like 20,000. And then, uh, therefore, that's another, uh, I need to do another talk for you. But if you're a small team, it's like, okay, who is doing what? The problem with small teams is usually everybody wants to do the same thing together, and which is nice. It challenges everyone. But at the same time, it doesn't help to build a project in the right way. Uh, and that's kind of this well-organized and complementary role. So like, OK, I'm going to be the game designer. I'm going to be the creative director. Great. Who is going to do the code? Who is going to come with the animation? Do we have someone for animation? No, we don't. Do we have someone for art? No, we don't. So finding out uh, how, who is doing what in each of the team, and especially having a common objective. What, we see, what I see a lot with developers is, Oh, I've got thousands of ideas. You know, I'm going to think like well, we can do this project or this project or this project. And then not being able to nail down to one project. And when we are on one project, 
trying to nail down to what makes this project good. So it's really about focus. Focus is key, and I think it's missing a lot. Um, when you start and when you have a small studio, obviously there is a key question because if you are two, three people, four, five, I mean, this is kind of all the kind of positions that you need. Obviously, you need someone for design, you need someone for art. I mean, artist, you need an art director, animation code, sound production, and QA. Okay, you need all those. Now, if you are two, that's a problem because you cannot handle that. So you can say, oh, of course, you know, I can do everything. So I will do a bit of art, a bit of animation, a bit of production. What I would advise, again, in terms of focus here, is how, what you can do in-house and what you can outsource. There are a lot of stuff that you can outsource. And whether you're a small studio or a bigger studio, obviously you can outsource those elements. So clearly, design, I mean, it needs to be in-house. You need to be the one coming with the ID, making sure that you develop those ideas and ideas make sense. Uh, honestly, I know some studios, bigger studios, not in Spain, uh, that are outsourcing design. And it's like, wow, this is amazing. You know, this is your key ID, your key IP, and you're not even designing yourself. You have someone else to design it. Very risky. So I would advise you to keep design in-house. Art, that's the second thing that as much as possible, I would keep it in apps. Don't need to do all the art. I mean, we do, we outsource a lot of, uh, let's say, character design. Let's say you have main character, one character, two characters, and then you need to do all the enemies, all the props, all the environments, that you can outsource. But at least the direction, the art direction, you keep it in-house. And that means that you need to have an art lead, an art director. So when you build your team, that's very a key element to get. Animation, that's something that, again, as you grow, you want to get in, but that's potentially something that you can you can outsource. Same thing, you would try to do the, the core of it and then get something outside if you cannot afford to do it inside. Code, so I would say design, art, and code are the three elements that you need in. You need, obviously, to get uh, someone to program. If you don't, that's tough. That's not going to work. Uh, and sound, you can outsource. Production, uh, again, that's something that in smaller teams, you don't have a producer. Uh, you're like, why do I need a producer? You know, I can manage and do everything. As soon as you grow and grow, to be honest, four or five, maybe up to 10, but this kind of even small team size, you need to have someone that is really taking this role of producer, that is going to be the annoying guy, uh, we know some of them here, uh, the annoying guy that uh, will go through, okay, the planning, making sure that stuff are happening. Because when we start the project, we're all like, oh yeah, sure, yeah, we know we're going to do that, and this is going to happen this way. And then it slip, and you know, it doesn't work. And we absolutely need someone to bring you back because otherwise, your game is going to release in 10 years' time, uh, if, and then you're going to spend six years of your life with not making any money because you will not have enough money to finish it. So that's very important. QA, very important as well to, um, obviously, you externalize this because QA is a lot of work, depending on, you know, if you need to test on the console, if you're doing mobile, you need to test on all mobiles, you cannot have this in-house. You also, but it's still very important to have one person in your team that can do the basic level of QA. Uh, and that can do the QA at all stages of the game. Not only like three months before release, but also when you get an alpha version, a beta version, you want to QA it to kind of find out the key uh, issues you may have in your title. Game design. So I create a slide, this is my preferred slide, which is designed by a non-game designer. So I'm not a game designer, so I'm happy that you guys come in and say, no, that should not work this way. But uh, I think there are certain things that are very key if you want to be successful. Quality, okay, quality. What is quality? Everybody say, oh, I'm going to make a qualitative title, of course. Uh, what does it mean? I think quality, which is very important, is no compromise. I will take an example, Subway Surfer. Subway Surfer is a runner. You know, there's been thousands of runners. There were Temple Run before Subway Surfer. Temple Run was usually successful. Why Temple Run is dead now? Why Subway Surfer is still alive? It was released in 20, uh, 2012, so we're now at uh, six, seven years after, still alive, still, still successful. It's successful because it goes to the detail. Everything in the game is very high quality. So it's not like, oh, there is an armor. Yeah, we don't have time for this armor. That's fine, you know, we'll do a nice armor and move to something else. No, it's better you do one armor rather than three, three or four armors, but this is really focused. Everything needs to be at this high level of quality. Today, if you release a game and you're not 80 plus as Metacritic, you're dead. I mean, I'm sorry, but uh, except maybe some very small exceptions and big IPs, but you're dead. So the first thing when you, when you come with your studio is you need to be 80 plus. Uh, you need to create the, um, the, the, the memento uh, that people knows about you. This is your first game or your second game. People will remember only this game. If you, are, if you release the first game at 60 or 50, they will remember that you're just a bad team and that, I mean, sorry, it's a bit very straight, but close your studio and open another one. 
you know, it's very important that it's very qualitative. Now, qualitative is also, and very important, is meaningful experience. And this is linked to the quality, which means every action you do in the game, nothing is free. Not, if I do something in the game as a player, it's because it means something afterwards. So this is very important that you have the, this purpose for the player, that it has an impact on my future progression. I'm not doing something because, oh yeah, there was a gun here, so I take a gun and I shoot at birds because I saw some birds, and that's it. Of course, you can do that. You can say, oh, that's fun. That's fun, but that's going to be, I mean, you're not going to be as good or as powerful as other, other types of the market. I do that, I shoot on birds, because maybe it would have an impact in my story, in my game progression, and so on. Very, very important to keep this in mind. The unique visual touch, I mean, this is something in Spain, this is great. I mean, you guys have great artists. There are a lot of uh, great, um, I mean, I would not say, sorry, if you are programmers in the room. I think it's difficult to find good programmers in, in Spain. They are, they are. I'm not saying they are not. But that's more difficult to find good programmers in Spain than finding good artists. So I think you should leverage that. If you want to stand out as a game on the market, you need to have this unique touch. So work, working your, your style is very important. Not being a copycat, not you know, replicating something existing. And that's something I think you, with all those great artists you got in this country, you should be able to achieve very well. Innovation. OK, don't be a me too. I mean, we've seen a lot in gaming industry. Of course, you got, uh, uh, I don't know, again, runner. You have a second runner. Uh, you got a uh, puzzle game like Candy Crush. Oh, we got 3,000 Candy Crush-like type of games. OK, what's the point about doing that? Doesn't mean any sense. That would not make you powerful and successful. And what I mean by innovation is what? You want to do uh, a puzzle game. You want to do an action-adventure game. You want to do uh, a racing game, whatever kind of genre. It's like, OK, what am I going to bring to this genre? And that can be very little features, very little things. But try to bring different ways to play. It may work. It may not work. Users may like it, may not like it. But at least you try to make the genre evolve. If you just, if you just say, oh, I like this in this game, so I'm going to do the same, well, why am I going to play your game? I should better play the first one on the market. They've been there before you. They are well, well more known than you are. Then there is no chance for you to, to succeed. And again, that's not about being innovation. It doesn't mean about, oh, I'm going to revolutionize the genre. Again, that's why I'm coming back to feature. That's very low level, finding low level mechanics that are interesting and that you think are different from what you've played so far. So that means, obviously, that you need to know the market very well. You need to play a lot of games. And then, that's my last point, you need to user test it. Because you may think, oh, you know, that's great. That's what I would love to play. Great. OK. I'm going to come. My next slide is about uh, you do prototypes and all this. You're going to do all those prototypes, but you need people to test. And not only testing when you're coming after your beta that you're about to launch and you just do QA and like, oh, yeah, then I'm going to take all my bugs out. Not at all. I mean, you test from the, need to test from the early stages with your mechanics. And even like when you do prototypes in paper, that's when you test with people. Of course, with your friends, family, and so on. And then you can go test in the street or whatever. But you need to test at all the stages to make sure that this is fun. If this is not fun, out. I mean, we're doing games. We're not here to make, I mean, sorry, we can make serious games. I'm not talking here about serious games, sorry. I'm talking about only about you know, fun video games. So it's fun or it's dead. So it's a bit, <laughs> a bit straight, but that's, that's the way. Um, gameplay making. So how do you test? Uh, because, of course, you're going to tell me, oh, it takes a lot of time to program. I need the money, and then I test. And if it doesn't work, I need to come back. So how does it work? Obviously, prototyping is key. And prototyping is like paper prototyping. You can do white box. I, I've just put some examples of here of some titles where you do that, and you can already, that's a great way to test the mechanic, to, stay, to test if it's working first for you in the game, uh, but also with some of your friends. And again, you test mechanic after mechanic. We're not talking about the meta game right now. We're just talking about you know, very small gameplay mechanics. Try this and see if they are fun. And then you'll see how you put them in a very nice meta game. Because the risk also is like, oh, I'm going to do this huge territory. This is a huge environment. And then, like, oh, I'm going to run from one side to the other side. It's going to take me half an hour. And what do I do during this half an hour? Nothing. Very boring, not interesting. Um, However, we still need a meta game, obviously. So once you have this kind of fun gameplay mechanics, low level, you need a meta game. You need a storyline. That's some examples of uh, what is important about the storyline. So this is Invisible Hours. That's an example here of how the characters are interacting one between the other. So I put this example because like, let's say you have all your low level fun gameplay mechanic. It's like how you, play, how you put them all in place within your meta game. And this is very important to go at the paper level because you can see when which one is going to play, when is the next one, and how do they interact one with the other. So that's 
like that was at the character level. Uh, here's his rhyme. That was kind of at the um, at the environment level. So uh, same thing. You push. You put within your metagame all those uh, low-level mechanics and to see how they're going to work and interact one with each other. And then you build your unique experience. So this is the player's pr progression. Okay, where do I start? Where do I go? Oh, I move on. This is a mobile game example. So I don't know, again, I don't know if there are mobile games guys here, uh, but let's be honest, whether it's PC or console, is the same. How do I progress in the game? Of course, you may not go to the shop and unlock content all the time. You may not have UGC, user-generated content, in your game. So that may depend on your game. But it's very important that you see how, why and how, as a player, I want to move on. Why do I want to continue? I want to continue because I want to replay the same thing? No, I want to continue because the story is fun. I want to continue because I've learned something that I want to apply later. So you need to track this down. And typically, here is like, OK, I play a campaign. Playing the campaign, I'm going to have experience, gold, earth stones, but I may lose lives because I'm going to die. So, okay, I, I don't know, I have three lives, I just have two now. Okay, what do I do? When I play well, well, I can level up. Okay, I level up, this is great. So that's helped me to unlock content. But I can find other ways to unlock content. Potentially it's like go to shop. Well, obviously if I go to shop, I'm losing gold. Uh, but I get a new item. And the new item, what does it help me? What's the new item help me to make a level? Because I can, and then I can move back to the UGC content because I created my own level. Or this new content can help me to unlock achievement, and so on and so forth. But then you have all those key mechanics, how the players is going to progress into the game, which are key. Okay, that was the fun part. Now I'm going to the boring part. Uh, no, it's not only this. Uh, production. I guess, I'm, I guess you guys know everything about production. I'm sure. So I will go maybe pretty fast on this one. Just to say that it's very important that you define milestones. Uh, so even we're going to talk about you know, whether you have a publisher or you're self-publishing, whatever. Even at the concept phase is you have milestone. What are my goals for this next month? My, I don't know, you can put a milestone for two months, but I would advise put a milestone for a month, put a sprint for two weeks. What do I do in those two weeks? What do I do in this month? What is my goal? This month, month two, month three, month four, month five, et cetera. I develop prototypes. Again, paper prototypes as I show you, but also obviously even ugly white box prototype, very important because when you need to talk to partners, they will say, okay, great, I've got your GDD, I've got your nice PowerPoint, I don't care, I want to play something. Nobody is buying, I mean, it was a case 10 years ago, you were presenting a nice PowerPoint, and be like, oh yeah, great, it's a nice PowerPoint, I love your idea, I finance it. That's dead, that's finished. Now everybody will be like, idea is nice, show me how I play it. And of course you're going to tell me, yeah, but I don't have the money to spend six months or nine months to create a nice vertical slice. Well, if you do, that's great, because that's typically what they want to see. But if you cannot have a vertical slice, at least come up with prototype. And again, it can be short prototype, but really showing the fun gameplay. And you can have art on one side with nice drawings whatsoever, and then ugly white box game on the other side with that show uh, how fun it is. All these, the idea is that you get, obviously, to the vertical slice. Vertical slice is what you get at the end of your pre-production. And vertical slice, the idea is that it shows the final quality of the game. And that's typically when, if you want to look for a partner, that's when they will get in. Because they'll be like, now I know what you're going, you guys are doing. I know how good it can be. Now we'll sign for it. And that's for you. That's a great place to, to, to test as well. If you test your vertical slice with user and nobody likes it, why are you going to spend all this money in production? And forget about it. Move to something else. So that's very important. Production, you know about the alpha, beta phase. So I'm not going to detail that, I'm sure. Uh, another very important phase, obviously, is polishing and debug. That's something that. A lot of developers kind of forget or just say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, we'll do it. And then, oh, it's rushed, you know, we need to finish the project. We are like in our milestone and it's not polished. To be honest, when you finish production here, if you have, let's say you have a good game, good concept, and so on, end of production, you are at uh, 60, I would say, 70% Metacritic. Now, the question is, we say we want to be 80, 85. Right? 90, okay, that's kind of marvelous, but that's very few projects. So let's say 80, 85 uh, to be on the safe side. 8085, you're going to go, it seems amazing, but you're going to gain 10 to 15 points around those three to four last months. Because that's when polishing, that's when you're going to show all this quality that you've been thinking of from the beginning. And then obviously certification, just, you know, you need to, when you do a console, you need to submit and all that kind of stuff. I can detail, but I'm not sure this is a subject here. Um, I'm just showing here um, a production, it's just a pipeline, just to show like a level creation. So uh, to kind of give you some ideas of the steps uh, that we are using, obviously you have an ID, global ID first of the game, then you're like, okay, in this level, this is what's going to happen. I think guys are going to go there, it's going to open the door, 
and then solve a puzzle on the side and come back and that will help him to solve something bigger. I don't know. So how you got this vision, how you define it, then obviously in terms of art and game design, uh, and then that helps art to start with concept. Then very important is the closed design requirements. So, you know, space limits, okay? The art guys need to know what is, in what space are we going to figure out what kind of uh, environment I need to build in terms of characters, how many characters. So all this part is very important to do at the beginning, because otherwise you will go all the rest, you define all the art, and then, sorry, I was going to be rude, you fucked, but uh, you are in a bad situation uh, that you cannot choose what has been designed. And then white box, really go for white box, tested it with white box against drawing, high level white box, used global, then you, when you've tested that and all the spaces, you can go back to your design requirements and be like, yes, that's going to work, no, it's not going to work, so I can amend at this time even before my artist is already like fully embedded into creating the environment, all the characters. Uh, revision, so that's where I was. Then uh, step eight, uh, I close the white box, now we are all happy. And we are all happy with the visual language. Very important as well is like how your player is going to understand what they have to do. And not only that, oh, you know, you have to open the door. This is boring, not interesting. So how you create visual language, and of course, you're going to tell me, oh, open the door is a very silly example. So people understand. Yes, I'm taking a silly example, but that's the same for, I don't know, jumping over a bridge or whatsoever. It's really about you need to define this visual language that people will understand from straight away, straight away and we want to get into the game. This is all the onboarding process. You know, what is very key in the game, of course, you can say the end, but I mean, we should do a survey. Like, you know, usually it's like you have about five to 10% of your gamers that are going to finish your game. So what is key is obviously what you spend at the beginning. You know, if you lose them uh, after 20 or 30 minutes, you're dead. So you're going to tell me, yeah, but I don't care. They bought it, that's done. Well, you care, because if they do that, it's going to mean bait rating, bait comments, and nobody else is going to buy it. And you care, because if you're doing mobile, this is kind of freemium and free to play, and if they leave after 20 minutes, you have no money, and again, you, you're dead. So you really care about this onboarding process. Again, spend a lot of attention and momentum from the beginning of the game, let's say for the first 20 minutes, for the first hour. It doesn't mean that forget about the rest. The rest is important, but if this is not good, no point, no point. Uh, so I was then, sorry, was white box closure, then you go for low level, and that's basically, well, it, I mean, then you go about ma making it and integrating it. So that's all the path, with making sure that each time you, that you integrate, you look again at it, you make adjustments, make sure it works, and obviously it will polish and all that stuff. But usually it's like, you know, people jump right to, in the last sense, oh, okay, I'm going to this character, it looks beautiful, and they don't think about all the rest before. So that's why I'm spending more time about the planning and uh, the thinking around it rather than jumping right away in what shall I do in this game. I have no idea where we are in terms of time, so I continue. Uh, financing. Oh, that's interesting. Why is it? Okay. Uh, financing. Just want to uh, summarize here uh, in terms of challenges. Because I guess most of you guys are developers and we are not looking at the same thing. You know, developers, publishers, and investors are not looking for the same thing. So I just want to summarize because Obviously, as you're not looking for the same thing, when you talk to an investor, when you talk to a publisher, it's like, we need to make, put ourselves in their shoes to kind of understand what they're looking for. So obviously, as a developer, you need money. I mean, you have this great idea, start a prototype, but hey, you need money to move it on. Money is key, and what you want is long-term stability, uh, because you don't want you to start your project, and after six months, it's done, because usually it will be like a year or two years project, so you want to make sure that you can go up till the end. IP. The intellectual property is something that I mean, most of the developers nowadays want to keep. You want to keep it because what are the strengths of your company? It's obviously your team, but some people can move. You can move from one team to the other. And it's, it's, your, it's your games and the IP linked to it. Because if you do a great game, maybe you want to do a game two, a game three. Maybe you want to make a movie, whatever, out of it. So it's very key to keep the IP. And that's always a struggle uh, with publishers because publishers want the IP as well. Uh, you want the publishing structure. I mean, I'm not going to give any names here, but. Nowadays, you have a lot of pretty small publishers and that say, yeah, I can do all the publishing work for you and we do all the marketing and all that. You, have, you want to control that because you don't want that they sell you something that they cannot do and obviously you have a great game but if nobody is aware of it, that doesn't work, that's a problem. And obviously you, got, you want a good return on investment and this is really about also ref share. You want to make sure that the publisher is not only financing your project but you want also to make sure that if it's successful, you need to get extra money out of it. So ref share is important. 
On the publisher side, well, they, I mean, I, I was going to be pretty bad, but it's a bit like bankers. Like, you know, when, when you go to the bank and you ask for money, they're like, yeah, sure, but I don't want to take too much risk. So as a publisher, I mean, it depends. They're not all the same, but a lot of publishers are like very slow and they want to get into the project as late as possible. So if you can come with a finished game, hey, perfect. Uh, and then I can see this is high quality, I'm taking no risk, I'm happy to do that. And if you can even finance it until it's finished, it's even, more, even better. Um, of course, a lot of them are coming, but what I was saying earlier is like vertical slides is really when you will see a lot of publishers coming in. Coming before is, uh, except if you have a huge and good track record, uh, and that's why, again, your previous games are good, and need to be good, otherwise that's a problem, but uh, otherwise they come pretty late. Uh, what is important as well is you have more and more publishers. Right now the market is really segmented. Um, so look around, look around for small publishers, look around, I put here for original uh, content. There are a lot of things happening in Asia. China is a huge market. Uh, they have, obviously, as you know, big publishers, uh, but they are developers, but let's say, let's say they're lacking good content. They don't only have good content, so they're kind of looking for, for good content. Uh, what is interesting also is they have gamers that are more and more experienced about games, so that are asking for more and more qualitative content. Uh, so that's kind of ways can be interesting to kind of move forward with your content. Uh, and investors. Uh, so investors is a bit complicated because you have very few uh, specialized investors uh, in video game. So that will be to go to investors that are not just into video game. And obviously what they look at is exit. I invest here because first question is like, okay, if I put, I don't know, 200,000, 500,000, a million, it's like in two years time, how can I get out of it? And that's, that's what the story you have to tell them. So the story is usually and not always, but can be much linked to self-publishing than publishing, because if you have a game and you have a publisher, okay, it's going to, you, you have your milestone payment, that's good, you're making money, you release your game, it's a huge success, okay? You have negotiated a good ref share, uh, you're going to increase a little bit your revenues, but that's it. It's a failure, that's fine, you're stable, but you say stable, 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 which obviously for an investor is not interesting. An investor, what they want, they want to see your company move on. And obviously self-publishing is interesting because you can show them that potentially you have more potential to get the, of course, you have more potential to, <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to crash as well, that's for sure. But that investors, they want, they want to take risk. You know, they will invest in 10 companies and know that it's only two that will be successful, but they want those two that, you know, to move on. They don't want companies that will grow very slowly. So if I go a step by step, creative path. So we at the beginning, you need a pitch deck, you need a prototype, better even a vertical slice, and you need a trailer. Trailer is something you can do. You don't have, you know, your game is not finished, but do a trailer. You know, GDD, those 200 pages, whatever, 100 pages GDD, nobody is reading them. You know, it's too long, nobody cares. Uh, it's great you make it, great for your team, but that's not a selling tool. So a pitch, nice short presentations, very important. A trailer is key, people are watching videos, that's why. So you can make even an animatic, something like that, but that really explain where you want to go with your gameplay. And again, to my previous point, that really explain how you are different, how you are innovative on it. Then uh, financial paths, so obviously usually you start with love money. So love money is your family, friends, uh, I mean all those people that are ready to put some money into it. Uh, again, there is always a question that comes to me about um, crowdfunding. I'm not a big fan of crowdfunding. I think crowdfunding is a marketing tool. Uh, if you do crowdfunding, if you have a small studios, who is going to put money? Your family and friends. Great. But then the crowdfunding company is going to take their share. Why your family and friends are not giving you money directly? Then you save this part. So I would say crowdfunding, use it later on if you are famous or you have a brand and you want to expose yourself and market your project before you release it. But just to get money, I'm not sure about it. Uh, seed money. So that will be kind of the next step, like let's say business angels. So this kind of uh, smaller investors. And again, that's I would say the circle behind your family. So it can be local people that have a bit of money and want to get into project. Uh, so that's interesting to tap into them. The public subsidiaries, we talked about media. There are some others, but we're not going to talk about it here. Uh, and then investors, that would be like more VC, but that's something coming later and that's related to my previous point. And then publishing pass, uh, I think I will, uh, yeah, I'll go to that uh, right after, uh, because obviously to explain a bit more what we can do in terms of publishing. Publishing, so. Finding a publisher or self-publishing? Well, it all depends on your cash flow. Uh, if you have no money, anyway, uh, 
it's a bit difficult to kind of self-publish uh, the risk level. Obviously, self-publishing, as I was saying, is a higher risk, but potentially more revenue and your competences. You know, can you do it? You don't do it. Because publishing is not only about making the game, it's also about selling and distributing the game. And if you don't know how to do it, it doesn't happen like that. So, so if you don't have the competences, don't really go there. I would, not, I would say not good. But whether you have a publisher or you self-publish, there are a few elements that are very important to keep in mind. Uh, one, and I think it was in the talk before, even if it was in Spanish, I understood a little bit of it. Uh, the target, obviously, that's something I didn't talk about, but when you make a game, and that's why you do all those user tests as well, is to see whether you have target. You have people that are interested by your game. So you need to define this target, very important. The milestone, if you sign with a publisher, they will ask you for a milestone delivery. So obviously, if you have worked this out before, if you have this as a production tool in your company, that will work very well. And then that stuff that publishers usually will do, but still to remember, obviously, localization, QA, you'll try to get them to do it. Ratings, uh, same thing, they will ask you and they will want to know what kind of ratings you're going to have. Uh, and the last part for me, is, even if it's at the bottom, is very important, is even if you, even if you don't self-publish, so you have a publisher, uh, basically you want to keep the IP. So this is your, your brand, this is your baby. So because this is your baby, you kind of want to keep the name, you want to trademark the name, you want to have the domain name, uh, and you may want also to do some demos, some trailers, some marketing content, because you are the one who knows the best the game. You are the one who can have better access to the creatives. So you may want, even if it's an extra budget, and maybe you can uh, invoice the publisher for that, you may want to be strongly involved in the campaign. And this is very important as well, because the gamers, let's be honest, they don't care about the publisher. Yeah, and true, you know, yeah, you know those big guys, but if, I, if you go in the street and you ask someone about, oh, Medal of Honor, or, I don't know, it's a very old game, sorry, but Call of Duty or whatever, you know, they know the game, but they don't know that Activision is behind. This is not really what, what they have in mind. But they may know the developer. So what they want, they want to be in link with the, with the creators. So whether you're publishing or not, this is very important that you are the face of your game in front of the public. Important for you, because it builds your image for your next, and next games, but also important for the game because I mean, nobody, you know, I'm more the marketing and business guy. I'm never in front of the cameras. I'm never in front of the journalists. They're not interested to talk to me, They're, which makes total sense. They're interested to talk to the creators, and you are the creators. Distribution. Um, so quickly, just to say that there are plenty of channels. That's what is great with video games. I think uh, video games is usually huge market now. It's been growing. I usually compare it like a uh, movie. It's interesting because, or TV series, that's a good comparable, and that's why you as indies, I mean, I guess most of, them are, most of you guys are indies, you have a great chance uh, of success in the future. Why? Look at Netflix. You know, Netflix, they come in, they do TV series. They need the content, they need a lot of content, and they went to a lot of producers to find this content. And in the gaming industry, this is coming the same. We're talking about, we talked about Stadia, we can talk about the Epic Store, I mean, I can talk about many, many, Netflix potentially good in two games, many, many, many different channels, Apple Plus, sorry, I'm maybe bringing more, that you've been seeing this last, uh, this announcements lately. Those guys, they want to differentiate themselves from their competitors. To do that, they need content. And obviously, well, content, of course, they can go to EA, Activision, those big guys, but those big guys are making huge AAA, very expensive titles. That's not how they're going to differentiate. They're going to differentiate themselves by having nice, smaller, innovative content that will come from you guys from Indies. And if you look again at the market right now, there have been more and more Indies, I mean, bigger Indies that have been purchased also by those guys to get content. So I think you have, there is really, it's a really good time for Indie title if, sorry, but if you follow all the steps before, because of course if you come with a shitty game, no chance for you. Um, so I was just mentioning a few here, Steam, you know, Epic Store, I mean, you know that. Uh, obviously, what is important and what can... Epic is interesting, an interesting story. The Launcher Store, I don't know if you saw, but basically, they've been looking for exclusive title. And exclusive title, they need exclusive title because they need to be exclusive to the other ones, otherwise you go to Steam and you don't care about going to Epic Store. Uh, by the way, it's better for you because you have to take less money uh, when you sell. You know, the, the, the Steam is 30% and the Epic is 12%, so it's better for you to sell on Epic. Anyway, going back to that, they've been looking for exhaustivity, uh, sorry, for exclusivity. And this is very good for you because what you need as an indie, you need visibility. And it's difficult because uh, marketing when I, you know, user acquisition, all that is very expensive. If you can work with those platforms, if you can show that your content is interesting and innovative and they take you, wow, you have a huge visibility. And maybe 
They launch a platform, maybe your sales are not going to be that great on the first one, but that's fine. You build it up. You're also building your brand, you're building your company, so you need this visibility at first. Uh, I was talking <coughs> about all the platform. We game, I mean, China, again, Asia is a huge market. PC, and more and more mobile. I mean, it's already huge in mobile, but uh, I mean, it's a market you should not forget about, and people like We Game are interesting, even if obviously there are a lot of constraints, government approval are very long and slow, but interesting markets. And then I'm just mentioning a few more that you may know or not, Origin Gog and Bolbondo, Exotis. I mean, all those guys, you can combine them. So this is good. It's like how I'm, you know, in the past when you were doing physical distribution, you want to be in all the stores. Well, digital is the same. You don't, of course, you're going to tell me, yeah, but Steam is 70% of the sales, so I go on Steam. Great. Super. Okay, go on Steam. Sure. But don't forget the other guys. This is important to go on the other guys. Because 70% of the market, but it means also a lot of titles, and you're going to be, you know, you're going to be uh, in, in this mess of all the titles, it's very difficult for you to stand out. And you may be in an humble bundle, which is going to come later and may bring less money at the beginning, but you can stand out. And that's maybe at the end of the day, that maybe actually is a channel that makes more money for you. So interesting to interact with all the channels. And then you're going to tell me, yeah, but I don't have time to do that. Okay, then that's where we go back to discussion, self-publishing or publishing. Uh, but more and more, you will need to develop those capabilities and have time uh, to do that. Online console, well, we all know that. Just one thing, obviously, I don't know if you work with Xbox, ID at Xbox, interesting. Uh, those guys are really kind of, I mean, maybe your experiences and it'd be interesting to share with me. But they are kind of, I, I, don't, I don't have any shares with Xbox, but I think they are, let's say, better structures to push indie than is PlayStation uh, at the moment. And Switch, I mean, you've seen a lot of obviously indie titles on Switch. I think to beat the end, there was like a lot of uh, indie guys going to Switch and making pretty good money. That was nice. But of course, now you've got too many. So now it's very difficult to stand out again on Switch. Physical distribution, do you want to do physical distribution? I mean, usually we do that to please the developers uh, because it's very nice to have a box that you can put on your shelf. Uh, what is nice is you can do some additional content with it, obviously, potentially DLCs, map, art books, whatever, that goes with a physical content. So it's not going to make a lot of money, but you know we're trying to do as many distribution channels as possible, so let's do uh, physical as well. And, and mobile is a total different world, so I'm, I mean, if you want, we can get more into the mobile, but that's... Uh, Different story here, obviously, as you have, you're kind of limited in terms of stores. Of course, you go to iOS. I think Apple Plus is very interesting. Look into it. They are definitely looking for content. Uh, and Android, it's obviously very complicated uh, to stand out on Android. So I don't know. I would not advise to go first on Android. Uh, then I have, still have some time. Yes. I don't know. Uh, marketing. So I'm just going to spend a bit of time on marketing. Um, because if you self-publish, or even if you don't self-publish, you need to be involved, and this is important. If your game is not known, you can have the better game on Earth, it's not going to work. So all the part of strategic marketing is, I will just focus on USP, so unique selling points. You have to define, and again, coming back to the beginning of my presentation, where it's like, oh, we find this innovative gameplay. And again, very small detail uh, in the game. I don't know, the guy is running like that, and this is fun because, I don't know, he's jumping differently. Uh, whatever. Uh, we find this. This is very fun. This is very interesting. We're going to push that and show that as a unique selling point. We know this is for this target, so we can define target, and then potentially you define the positioning. So positioning, again, uh, what, what I'm, this part of strategic marketing, what is very important about it is usually when you communicate about a game, you go to see a journalist and you tell everything about the game. Well, the game is doing this, 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 and this, and this, and this. Great. Okay. So you have a nice coverage, and that's it. And then you come the following months, and then the journalist says, oh, so you want another coverage. So what is the game doing? Uh, well, I told you everything. So it's very important that you kind of define really what, why the game is different, and then you define themes. And you say, okay, I've got a campaign. I'm going to run this campaign. Every month, every two months, I'm going to tell <coughs> part of the story to build a full story that will help you to get more coverage, more visibility, which obviously is key for your game. And for that, you need to have all the qualitative assets going with your qualitative game, which are obviously screenshot, trailers, dev diaries, their diaries are very nice uh, because, again, that's a way to promote your team, artwork, marketing plan, and so on. PR, uh, I will just take uh, mock reviews. So I don't know if you know mock reviews, but obviously I say Metacritic is key. You need 80, 85. Okay, great. How do I know I'm going to get 80, 85? You do the user test. That's great. But mock review are a way to you. Uh, so you need to pay them a little bit, but you work with journalists that are no more journalists. Uh, and that used to rate games, and they gave you their point of view on your game. 
that's great because then you can adapt your campaign and your way to communicate about it because you know whether you're going to be more like 75, 80, 82, and what works and what doesn't work for them. So that's interesting to go that. And you need to build with, obviously, I'm talking about journalists, but it's with streamers. With all those guys, you need to build a long-term relationship. So a studio tour, you know, and you don't have to uh, pay a trip from the US guys. I mean, you have a lot of streamers around. Why you don't have a few streamers that come to your studio and you show them the progress of your title? And you start to create this relationship, and they will do kind of free advertising for you. Qualitative material, we talked about it. Previews, reviews, obviously, you want to be, so you don't want the game to be ready just the day before submission. You want to have some versions again that you can have before that you can send previews to a journalist that obviously they review the game and then uh, they kind of support you before launch. And of course reviews, you can adapt when you want to send the review code depending on whether you think that your game is great. And of course you want to send this before the launch because then you're going to have great uh, Metacritic or whether you think your game is average and then you want to send them later that obviously people when they go to store, when they're online, uh, basically they don't, uh, they don't see the average Metacritic. Social media channel, <coughs> influencer. Obviously, that's we're talking about. You know, most of your games are going to be sold on digital channels. So for that, you need to get the people that are talking to the digital channels. So having all those guys into your your network is key. That can be very costly. So again, that's why we start first with. It's it's like the I don't know. We have a strategy of the onion. You know, you have the heart of the onion, and you start with the first. Uh, the first uh, part around the onion, and then gradually you go bigger. But really start with, that can be local, start with local, start with fans. Um, yeah, very important. And then that's linked to event. Uh, event is expensive as well, but that's a way to meet people, to meet all the streamers and all those guys. So that's why those events, some of them can make a lot of sense to go, and that's, I was mentioning ID at Xbox, for instance. They have booths on those events where they present indie titles. Right. You know, why well, you don't discuss with them, push your title, be there, you don't pay the booth, uh, you don't pay the presence, and then of course, you still need to pay your travel, but that's a way to start and to integrate uh, the, the industry and get the, the right influencers around you. Uh, all the media, uh, well, it's mainly finding partnerships, finding retail promotions, so again, like on a Steam, how do you have a special placement on Steam? Uh, how are you going to find support from different partners? Um, so being very creative in, in this way. Uh, and then partnership, I was talking about here about obviously bundle, co-branding, so I can be better with another game. Uh, we did that a lot in VR, for instance, where you put two, three VR titles, even from different developers, different publishers, but that's where it's say, okay, now you see we are in the same field, the same genre, so that's kind of create an experience and something that, boom, we're back and we promoted on the Steam store, for instance. Uh, endorsement is more like if you have stars or people like that that can endorse, but maybe not, not in this case. And last but not least to finish, uh, very important is sustaining. I mean, it's not because the game is released, that's fine, let's move to the next one. No, 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 this is the beginning. I mean, uh, again, we used to have very long marketing campaign. We were starting six to nine months before release and building up the momentum. Now it's not the case anymore. We have short marketing campaign. We start very close to release, let's say three, uh, it depends on the title, but three to six months maximum before release, you start the campaign. That's good because that reduces the cost. But that means also that when the game is released, you need to continue to push it. And you need to push it on the development side with DLCs of live services. I mean, right now, guys, I mean, you see the market is moving to gamer services. So it's how you make sure that you can continue the development of your game and selling after the launch. It makes total sense. You guys have been spending a lot of time, energy, and money to capture those gamers. Then you launch, and then three weeks after, oh, forget about it, we move to the next one. No, 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 you want to keep them, you want to capitalize on them. There are a few ways to capitalize on them. One is obviously, they will know your studio, they will know who you are, so when you come with the next game, they're like, oh yeah, I'm part of the community, I love those guys, so I'm going to buy this second game, or third game, or fourth game. But another way is also, oh, I love this game, so any additional content you can put into the game, not everybody's going to buy it, of course, but more people are going to buy it. Uh, very important in marketing as well, uh, promotions. You know, I mean, again, if you release game on Steam on all the platform, you know, you make a lot of, and I think the video game industry is very good at that compared to, I don't know, music industry, all those kind of guys, which the price is dropping very quickly. I don't know, price your game at a good price at launch. And maybe you're not going, you're making like, I don't know, 15, 20% of your sales. That's okay. You know, you're going to do a run up of promotion every month, every two months, and being Sony, Microsoft, Steam, all those guys, they have a lot of promotion set, Easter promotion, Christmas promotion, whatever, you name it. 
and there is stuff happening every month, you can be part of that. That's a way to push it. That's a way people are like, oh yeah, I heard about this game, I'm not sure it's too expensive. Boom, promotion, they buy. So there is a, actually, it's not a short life cycle. We used to say, and especially in physical, oh, you release a game and then three weeks after uh, you're out, you make 80% of your sales. You go uh, mid price or budget price, then you make another 20 and that's out. You're out after six months. Contrary to what we may think, this is not the case with digital. Digital actually creates a long tail. So you need to think and follow this long tail that, as you can make more and more revenue as it goes. And CM, so community management, is key, obviously. You want to build those guys. You want to have fans to your whatever Facebook page, website, all your social channels, because this is, even if you're not publishing or self-publishing, this, this is your first fan base. And those guys, you can create competition with them. And distribution, I was talking about uh, new channels. Uh, well, I mentioned a few that opened like uh, even a few weeks ago. New territories, again, Asia, a lot of nice places to try things. And that's maybe you don't want to try with when you release a game, because you're like, uh, you know, I don't know, it's going to be privacy, uh, it's going pri piracy, you know, I'm not sure about this, but that's stuff that you can try after the release. You know, uh, the game is, has been there for a while, so you can try it. And business models. Uh, I can mention a few. One which was interesting, I think, is what we did with Invisible Hours. I mean, unfortunately, they are not in good shape at the moment, but uh, GameStop. GameStop created a publishing label called Game Trust. What we did with them was a co-publishing. So basically, it was like, okay, they invested in the game, but our interest was we're like, okay, we launched a VR game. VR is a difficult market. We need people to try. People to try, that costs a lot of money because obviously, I mean, I cannot pay, I cannot rent this place here and have people to come and try my game. Too expensive. But if I got a partnership like GameStop, they've got 3,500 stores around the world. If in all those stores, because they want to show off what VR can look like, they show my game, hey, that's interesting. Because then I got people to get into an understanding. So it's not only about putting money in the game, it's also having those kind of operations that helps me to get this extra visibility that I need. That's what I wanted to say to you. I don't know if you have questions, if it was interesting or not. You can tell me. Uh, I'm happy to discuss and, uh, and to answer some questions. Pues muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, okay. one, two. we can discuss later. I mean, I'm happy to uh, discuss with you. I mean, you know, I think it's very important we share our experiences.